been one of the most impactful persons in NASCAR as we know it today in so many levels, in so many ways, is the Waltrip family. But Daryl Waltrip especially has really carried that torch. We think about Dale Earnhardt, yes, and, and, and you saw that piece during that where obviously Dale uh, Earnhardt uh, Sr. and Daryl Waltrip were really good friends. And uh, the, the unfortunate thing was Daryl Waltrip was calling that race at Daytona on the air when that accident happened. Talk with us about Daryl Waltrip and who he was as a driver. Help us, you know, just wrap our arms around. This is a guy who's not going to be around anymore. And you think about how much we took for granted, boogity, 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 boogity. I mean, the the one la the last boogity, boogity, boogity. I tell you what, if if if, if that did not move you, you're you're dead. You're dead, and and you're a ghost or something. What are your thoughts, Steve? Uh, you know, Dirt Walter's career has has definitely had a lot of high points, a lot of low points to it, and I think he kind of highlighted some of the low points with being on the air with Dale Earnhardt Sr. when uh, he wrecked 2001 at Daytona on the final lap, the final turn uh, of that race. Um, you know, Daryl come from the backwoods of Kentucky. Uh, this is this is back during a time when um, you, you, this was a very southern sport. <clears throat> It was very much, uh, you know, you you did not have brand names, uh, you did not have brand sponsors most of the time, um, and, and he, you know, he, he along with many others in that generation, legitimized the sport, um, you know, and opened the sport to to new people. You know, you 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 look back at his eighty what, about eighty three wins or something like that in the sport. Um, he won. You know, dozens for driving for Junior Johnson uh, uh, and, and other teams. I mean, he he made the Gatorade and the Tide colors famous in their sport um, long before other drivers uh, put that on their cars. And uh, you know, he won the Daytona 500, and you know, we saw him dancing, in, or we've seen pictures and videos of him dancing in victory lane after winning the Daytona 500 and uh, breaking down and. Uh, you know, just just his career has had uh, just an impactful statement on on the sport. And you know, when he steps in, when he stepped out of the booth for the final time at Sonoma last week, uh, you know, it's uh, you know, there's there's obviously something that's going to be missing there. Uh, sometimes we we complain or we we go after him for not necessarily being as close to the sport as he was when he started at Fox 20, 21 years ago. Um, and uh, you know he was close to the sport, but you know the the cars and the technology and the sport has changed so much that you know the, that's why sometimes it's more relatable to talk about uh, Dale Jr. or Jeff Gordon because they haven't been out of the car that long and they can relate to what's going on currently in the sport today. And uh, Darrell Waltrip had a lot of old stories and a lot of stories from. You know, one stock car racing really was actually stock car racing. They didn't have the technology. They didn't have the rules that they have today. Uh, you know, it, it was a purely mechanical sport, and today, you know, a lot of that has changed. So, you know, as Daryl has tried to keep up with the times, you know, we've, we've sometimes said that, you know, maybe he's not as close to the sport. But, you know, his wealth of knowledge over the years is is just as impactful and just as meaningful uh, because if we don't know the stories of the sport, if we don't know uh, where we came from, and if we don't have the people like uh, Darrell Waltrip around to tell those stories, then you know the the stories of today sometimes don't matter as much because you know we all had to get here some way somehow, and, and that was the bridge from then to now. And Darrell Waltrip stepping out of the booth, um, you know his impact will be felt around the sport. Um, you know he he could he could he he had a lot of influence with. Uh, uh, TV and drivers and, and and crews and he can go and talk to them and and and, uh, and gather the necessarily information to to discern it back to us uh, on on air each week and you know while you know his his commentary on the air of calling the races um, you know everybody has their own style and I think he'll be missed. Well, he definitely will be missed. 
That's for sure. You know, it's it's kind of comical, if, especially for those of us that know the history of the sport and have been around the sport for a long time. You know, back in the day when Daryl was still in the car, Daryl and Jeff uh, raced against each other. And, and uh, to use a, a cliche as, uh, uh, saying, you know, he basically felt like uh, – Jeff Gordon was like one of these young whippersnappers coming up trying to trying to uh, take over the sport. And as we've we've seen generations of of drivers who the young drivers are now the old drivers, and now we have the young drivers. And we look at like Jeff Gordon and now Chase Elliott, and we look at uh, you know. But <laughs> truth be told, Daryl Waltrip and Jeff Gordon uh, were, were were let's just say. Maybe not rival enemies, but they certainly did not like each other. And and basically, Jeff Gordon back in the day was like, "Hey, DW, get out of the way, Just get out of the car. You're too get out of the way, old man." And there was that strong strife between the two of them that really, when when Jeff Gordon retired and they came to DW and said, "Hey, we'd like to bring uh, Jeff Gordon in," there was a time there where where DW said, not, not here, not me, but they worked through that. But now it seems like they have become friends since they become in the broadcast booth, but they really were uh, arch rivals for the longest of times. Yeah. I, I think you did kind of hit on the point and a lot of us did see the same thing that, you know, the, the being in the booth together, especially for that first season together, it, it, or even for a majority of that first season, there was a lot of um, you. You could tell each of them were were trying to talk over one another. Each of them were still kind of at one another's throats because they would call one another out on uh, one thing or another. And you know, there there seemed to be some on air bickering. Um, you know, the you know subtle jabs and on air bickering that you know didn't devolve into to total fights or anything like that. But you you could tell that there there was still that angst between the two and they've worked it out and, and they became very good partners in in the TV booth. And I think that just goes back to to what drivers you know on the track these drivers are on the track uh they're with one another but you know 38 38 weeks a year and you know sometimes sometimes these rivalries don't just end when they get out of the car i mean we hear years and years down the line um you know these drivers that 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 beat and bang and had fist fights and you know, these these rivalries went on for years after they got out of the cars. And, you know, we've heard the Allensons talk about it. We've heard the Yarborough talk about it. We, we, we've we heard numerous other drivers that have been in the cars and said that years down the line, you know, we never talked to one another. We just didn't do it because, you know, it just, you know, we never let it go. And um, <clears throat> I think the same was happening here. But, you know, in, in time, sometimes, you know, times change people's minds, especially when you work that close together. Um, you know, they have time before when they're off the air, when they're on the air. Um, they can air some of these grievances out and sometimes come to a common place. And I think that's exactly what we saw between Jeff Corn and Daryl Waltrip um, being in the booth for so long that they were able to work some of these uh, these issues out that they had between them. And, uh, you know, we, we've seen them work together very, very closely this season. And, and this is even before the announcement came back. You could just tell that the dynamic in the booth between the two was a whole lot different. Now, maybe they already knew, you know, months earlier in Daytona before they came to Bristol, you know, six, seven weeks later and said, you know, I'm going to step out of the booth. And maybe they already knew this. And maybe that changed a lot of things, but you know, uh, either way, I think we saw a different dynamic this year between Jeff Gordon and Darrell Walter Jr. And we even saw a lot of that, you know, some last year too. But you know, there's a lot of growing pains, and they worked a lot of this stuff out. And I think they'd be right. I think they have become good friends. I think that they will continue to talk. I don't think that they'll stop talking and just become mortal enemies yet again. I think you know that's a productive future for the two. Yeah, absolutely, and I think so. And it, it, it's it was it's a, it was a fun rivalry. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the Xfinity races. It rolls off this afternoon, three thirty. NBC uh, Sports and NBC picks it up from here. Uh, obviously, Fox's uh, term for twenty nineteen is over, uh, so NBC picks it up. MRN has the call. 
I I I tell you what, I I I guess I'm just a radio guy and a radio fan. I I mute my television and listen to the MRN call because I tell you what, if you've not listened to the to the NASCAR MRN call, they nail it. Nail it. They make you feel like you're there. Absolutely. But Tyler Reddick, Cole Custer, Christopher Bell, Joey Logano, Michael Annette, Ross Chastain, uh, Justin Haley, uh, Chase Briscoe, Zane Smith, and John Namachek all round out uh, the fastest in practice so far. It looks like a good day for Chevy today. Let's talk about the Xfinity Series in Chicagoland this afternoon. Well, I think we'll just continue to talk about the same old people. Um, you know, Chris Rebell continues to be the cream of the crop in the Xfinity series. Um, you know, and, and, you know, again, he continues to be that cream of the crop, but he also continues to be asked, what are you doing next year? Are you going to be back in the Xfinity series car? Are you going to finally move the cup, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, he, he – uh, you know, I think he has a lot of legitimacy in the fact of people asking this question so often and and so frequently as to, you know, when are you going to get in a cup car? Because he wrote, performs very, very well in, in, in the Xfinity Series car. He's been there for a lengthy amount of time. You know, typically a longer amount of time than we see some of these development drivers in, in the Toyota camp. Um, just doesn't stick around too long in the Xfinity Series Cup two seasons or something like that. But, you know, he continues to just chug on down the line and yeah, I think, you know, every single week he's a threat to win. Um, you know, there's there's few other drivers out there except for when Kyle Busch gets in a car or, you know, somebody else, a cup series driver gets in a car and uh, goes out there and dominates a race. But, you know, for him, uh, I think he's just dominating a lot of this season, a lot of the headlines right there. I think he'll continue to do it even this weekend in Chicago. Um, and I, I would just, you know, if you're, if you're uh, checking some boxes off on who's going to go to victory lane and pick check five later this afternoon, I'd look at Christopher Bell. Because honestly, um, you know, I think he is the cream of the crop right now. And, you know, while there is a couple three out there that, you know, are competitive week in and week out, he just seems to dominate the spotlight almost every single weekend. All right, let's uh, uh, real quickly, we'll wrap it up with the the big boys, the Monster Energy Series, Chicago Land. Uh, what what do we got going on? What are the storylines? What are the uh, what what's going on? And, and, and by the way, also while we're doing this, go ahead and talk with us about the the track itself and give us the breakdown of the track and what can we expect for tomorrow's race three o'clock in chicago well one thing i wish that they would do out in chicago is i think they need to open up some more lanes out there um you know whether they need to put some compound down out there or they need to run tire dragon out there and spread this spread these uh, uh um spread these grooves out a little bit more um they I, I unfortunately I think you know we're going to see some of the same type of racing that we've seen in the past at Chicago. Now I know that we've tried to play around with the with the package and hope to get some of these a little bit closer, but um, I'm not sure if Chicago lands the right place that is going to see a discernible difference like we have seen it like a sh- uh, Charlotte a couple of weeks ago where we were running very very close together all the way around the racetrack, um, but you know again. Uh, you know, I could I could be surprised because I have been surprised at some of these tracks that uh, just the package itself has closed up the field a little bit more than 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 we've seen in previous years. But um, you know, Joe Logano, he he's uh, he's out there. He's trying to prove himself yet again this year that he is the defending series champion out there. Um, and and for him, he's already he's leading the points this far into the season. Um, but when when you look back to the field with the with the, <clears throat> sorry, Kyle Busch right behind him. I mean, he's got four wins more than more than anybody else except for Martin Truex Jr., which is uh, you know not really all that unsurprising to me that you know he's moved over and you know they're they're putting together wins at Martin Truex Jr. because they're just using the same technology, the same people in place, same crew chief. So you know that's really not shocking. But the shocking really part to me is that Stuart Haas Racing has not dominated this season like we saw last year and in the previous seasons. We've not seen uh, Kevin Harvick go to victory lane one out of every four or five races throughout the year. He's still winless right now. Um, it seems to be Penske Racing right now that has the dominant factor on the Ford camp. Uh, Joe Logano, obviously, and, you know, uh, Brad Keselowski is working his way up there at the same time. Brian Blaney is uh, 
out there, and they seem to be leading a lot of times uh, when uh, Stuart Haas Racing just isn't doing so. And whether it's just the changeover to the new body or or, or whatever the case is, uh, I'm not quite sure at this point what it is. But, you know, hopefully Stuart Haas Racing will step it up a little bit because we 